Pfizer for putting this together. I think we all miss seeing each other in real person. Uh, and uh, after two years of uh, webinars in t-shirts and shorts, uh, it's nice to dress up again. So, okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, early tumor AF and um, uh, this, uh, there's lots of pictures in my slides because uh, I was worried about food coma and people falling asleep. So, um, so we're going to talk about four things. So one is uh, AF demographics, uh, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And then just a refresher about stroke prevention in AF, which is the most important thing everybody needs to do. <clears throat> and I'll show you one the, the, some new data about why it's important to treat atrial fibrillation early. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last bit, uh, I, I do need your help, uh, is that we need to be able to treat these patients holistically. And, and for this, uh, we need everyone to contribute to this. So, um, so everyone knows this, atrial fibrillation. Um, so the French call it dementia of the heart. Uh, because the heart forgets how to beat regularly uh, and is the most common sustained arrhythmia we see in humans. And the physiology is fairly simple. So basically, you first start having small areas uh, that behave like epilepsy. So they, they keep jojoing the heart, they irritate the heart, and then the heart grows faster. And then as more and more episodes of AF start, the heart starts to undergo changes. So if there is some sort of some, some kind of uh, uh, Call it damage, but essentially it's structural, electrical, and pathophysiological changes to the heart. We call this remodeling. So as time goes on, you get more and more AF because the first episode of AF makes it more likely for you to get a second, and once you have a second, the third one comes even more easily. <coughs> and the result is that you get this electrical chaos. So the top of the heart beats at about 305, 300 to 500 beats a minute. Uh, and that manifests itself as an irregular QRS uh, and an irregular pulse when you feel the patient's pulse. Uh, and unfortunately, um, all of us uh, will see more and more AF patients uh, as our country ages because increasing age is a key risk factor for AF. And if you look at population pyramids, uh, this is what it looks like in 1950 in the US. 2000, it looked a little bit like this, looking more like a pyramid uh, and then by 2050 we're going to see a skyscraper so less young people a lot more uh, patients who are older and as a result of this we will see more and more AF uh, and so if you look in every single country this is a US projection for atrial fibrillation it goes up every year we're somewhere around here and actually uh, they were projecting at worst maybe just under 10 million uh, AF patients Actually, the U.S. has got now about 12 million already. So uh, all the projections are all uh, quite conservative and we've exceeded the numbers. So just a reminder, um, all you need is one ECG to confirm a diagnosis of AF. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to do a whole third. If you have one ECG that looks like that, that patient has atrial fibrillation. So irregular QRS, no organized atrial activity, cannot see any T waves. This very nicely sees a very uh, wavy, wandering baseline. And so this is AF. Now, of course, more and more of our patients will come in and say, Doc, my watch tells me I have a problem. Uh, is this acceptable? Um, and the answer is, well, just depends on the quality of the data. So this is a patient of mine, sent me his, uh, he's been having palpitations. So the son bought him a, a Apple watch and tells him to turn it on each time he doesn't feel well. Um, this is what he recorded and he sent it to me. Um, so you can see, the ECG is clear enough, it's clearly irregular, you cannot see any P waves there. So yes, I accept this as documentation and confirmation that the patient has atrial fibrillation. Okay, tied to the symptoms, and so this is good enough. And so as a result of this, you may see that we pick up more and more AF because patients will wear it on their watch and they say, look, doc, my watch tells me I have AF. And whenever it happens, I don't feel very well. Uh, and so that's good enough. Now, um, we, the technology has also allowed more of us to screen for AF opportunistically and I thought this might be of interest to you, so uh, I'll share two examples here. So this is called Cardia, actually you can buy this online. And it's basically a small little device like this uh, and the patient just has to put their left fingers and right fingers on it and it connects by Bluetooth to an app. Um, and the app will tell you whether there is AF or there isn't. Um, and this device costs about $200. Mm -hmm. 
And so some Canadian GP decided that they will leave the cardiac ECG at their reception. So when you come and register to say I'm here to see the doctor and you're above the age of 65 years old, they'll ask the patient just put their fingers there for 30 seconds while the nurse pulls up your record. Okay. Um, and so uh, they did this and only for 30 seconds. Um, so 184 Canadian GPs took part with this uh, and they screened 42% of their patients were above the age of 65 years old. Uh, and they found 471 cases of AF and they started anticoagulation in most of them. So really how technology can help uh, everybody to pick up more AF. Uh, China has gone to the bit that subtracts the human. So this is called Ping An Good Doctor. So if you go to China, you may see one of this. So you walk in um, and basically you either talk to a robot or you will talk to a GP who is sitting hundreds of miles away. And so let's say uh, you are diagnosed with I don't know, a cold or something, then the GP will send an instruction to this dispensing machine here. Uh, so you pay to the dispensing machine and cough medicines comes out of the dispensing machine. So this is essentially uh, a GP booth uh, and it allows them to actually use fingers to detect AF, there's a blood pressure cuff inside, there's no machine and you can go there anytime. Um, and so these are some of the things that are happening um, around the world uh, that utilizes some of these devices. Um, so much so that they thought that we, they could even do it in rural India. So this is the Smart India study. Um, same, the similar device that I, I showed you earlier. Um, and so what they did was that they went around to all these rural villages with a non-doctor. In fact, they used a medical student. Uh, and using one phone, um, they were able to screen 2,100 patients in five days and each patient contributed three ECGs on three separate days. Uh, and based on this, they detected 33 episodes of patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, <clears throat> the pickup rate is not high. I, I don't, I'm not sure whether this is even cost effective, but certainly it gives the opportunity that even for patients who cannot get to a doctor, we can make use of very, very simple technology. Uh, to help the diagnosis. So, from our context, there are three important reasons why AI uh, is, is important to practice. this. Uh, as I said to you, it's very, very common, more common as we get older. We estimate that those above the age of 80, <coughs> one in five have atrial fibrillation. So we should be seeing a lot of these patients. Uh, we all know AF is not harmless. So if you have AF, your risk of death increases by 200%. Your risk of a stroke goes up by 500%. So one in four strokes in Singapore are caused by AF, and unfortunately, most of the serious strokes are caused by AF because the ambulance that you get comes from the heart and it's much bigger than the ambulance you get from the neck. Uh, and as I've shown you, AF can be difficult to detect. A lot of patients have no symptoms. It comes and goes. Uh, and uh, so when, when you do a routine ECG and it shows sinus rhythm, it doesn't exclude the fact that the patient can be having atrial fibrillation sometimes. So it's hard to so common, dangerous, hard to find, expensive to treat, um, so that becomes a major healthcare issue for everyone. <coughs> uh, and just to explain why uh, AF causes stroke, so this is a TEE image on someone with atrial fibrillation, uh, and you can see, clearly see here in the left atrial appendage, there is a very big clot. Uh, this is what happens when the surgeons excise the appendage, you can see clots within it. Uh, and sometimes they are impressively large, particularly in patients with mitral valve disease. Um, so this is a nine centimeter clot in the atrium. Uh, very rare we see this nowadays, but um, this was what they looked like on echo. So if there was only one slide you remember from, from, uh, from today's talk, please remember this. So I'm making it flash so that it's psychedelically <laughs> burning in the back of your brain. Um, whatever it is uh, you decide to do with AF, whether you want to refer, you don't want to refer, please make sure you anticoagulate the patient if their stroke risk is appropriate. Okay, you have to protect the brain. Uh, that is the biggest thing you can do for any AF patient. But I'm sure you all do more than that. Uh, and as you know, in, in this day and age, um, we all have been using uh, uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants for a very long time. Uh, we don't call them no X anymore because they're not very normal. They've been around for about 10 years now. So uh, I think they're all called Doax. Um, and so uh, I've chosen an example. This is a Pixaban. Um, and you know that compared to our old 
uh, favor of warfarin. Um, the the DOEX are all better than warfarin in terms of uh, preventing stroke or systemic embolization. So there's a 21% reduction here uh, for Vixaban compared to warfarin. Not only are they more effective, they are also safer. So there's a 31% reduction in terms of major bleeding. So more effective, less bleeding. Um, and for a big span in particular, um, there is even a survival benefit, probably because it prevents more stroke uh, and it causes less bleeding. So this translates to an 11% improved survival compared to morphine. And so this is all from, from the Aristotle trial, which was published more than 11 years ago. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. Now, the, the question that I still get from time to time is, but I'm very worried about bleeding. My patient is also very worried about bleeding, only wants to take aspirin. And so I, I want to remind everyone about the Everall study, which actually for me is, is, uh, is, is the most convincing evidence why we should not give aspirin to patients who have atrial fibrillation. So just to remind you, Everall was a Pixan versus aspirin. And to get into the study was fairly simple. If you felt that the patient was unsafe for warfarin, or they had a bleeding episode of warfarin already, you can put them into the study. <clears throat> and so they randomized uh, more than 5,000 patients, uh, and basically they were given either a big uh, and there was a dose adjustment if your kidney function wasn't so good, uh, or you were very light, or you were very old, or yeah, half of them were aspirin. So this is basically a big versus aspirin, direct comparison, okay? So not surprisingly, if you give an anticoagulant versus aspirin, you can see that the anticoagulant prevents 55% more strokes than aspirin. That's not surprising, okay? But what I want to draw you to is this. If you look at hemorrhagic stroke for a band is 0.2% per year, for aspirin is 0.3% per year. There is no statistical difference between taking a band and aspirin. So it does not cause more bleeding. Okay. Let's look at the bleeding complications. Here's major bleeding, 1.4% for Pixaban, 1.2% for aspirin, statistically not significant. Intracranial bleeding, no difference. Ex uh, fatal bleeding, numerically, uh, there was less in the Pixaban group than aspirin, uh, but it was not significant. So, and even minor bleeding uh, doesn't reach significance. A little bit more nose bleeds and a little bit more cuts. That's it. So the data basically shows that you are not doing patients any benefit by, by allowing them not to take a big event and instead taking aspirin because there's no effect for aspirin in terms of stroke prevention. At the same time, the safety is exactly the same. Okay, so I think this is what I normally tell my patients when they tell me, Doc, I think aspirin is safer. I, I tell them I disagree. So, okay, so we've, we've covered that bit. So the, the first bit of, of uh, once you've uh, diagnosed the AF to, to basically protect the brain, um, I did talk about left atrial appendage occlusion, but these are for the, those patients who really cannot tolerate any kind, cannot tolerate aspirin, cannot tolerate uh, a big band, and, and they have intracranial bleeds, uh, they have very bad GI bleeding, uh, then we will offer them a mechanical alternative to, uh, to, to stroke prevention. Then the next thing we're going to talk about is treating symptoms. Um, and uh, for this, I'm going to show you two graphs. So this is basically uh, the outcomes from randomized study that compares drug treatment against catheter ablation uh, for control of symptoms in paroxysmal AF. Now, uh, the graphs clearly you can see that radiofrequency ablation is much more effective than drugs. That's not surprising. That's not the point of this. I'm showing these graph to show you that the lower line here represents drug therapy, okay? So this is in a strict randomized control study. And the point I want to show you is that at one year, no matter what drugs you give, less than 30% of patients have rhythm control on drugs, okay? So that's what the slide should tell you. So when patients tell me, you're giving me this drug, and is it going to work? I tell them it's about 30%. Because in the strictest possible conditions, in a randomized study, it is 30%, right? Okay, uh, and, and so that's the expectation. So, but I said you should try first. If you want to try, you can try first, but that is the expectation. So, a lot of um, uh, uh, physicians have thought, well, you know, if drugs really don't work, why don't we just try ablation as the first treatment 
And so there have been two papers published in the last uh, year uh, of such a, a strategy. So this is the early AF study, so about 300 patients never taken any drug before and they randomized them to antiarrhythmic drugs or uh, ablation, but this is using a freezing ice balloon, so it's called cryo balloon. Uh, and you can see again, ablation is much more successful than antiarrhythmic therapy. Uh, and uh, the, the, the key is that the complication rate was very, very low. But certainly the studies have been done. Um, and again, almost identical study. I think there were two groups. They were both published in New England Journal the same month. Uh, and uh, this was 200 patients, never received any drugs before, randomized to either having an ablation or having drugs. And you can see again, ablation success, nearly 75%. Um, and the ablation criteria are very strict. You can have your ablation and you cannot take drugs afterwards. All the drugs have to be stopped in three months. So this 75% is actually a very, very good result. Okay. Um, and so as a result of doing all this, the thought process over the last five years have been, do we get a better result if we do ablation or we offer rhythm therapy earlier? So one of the things that uh, people have looked at is that they looked at the time from the diagnosis to the patient receiving ablation to see whether that is a factor in terms of predicting long-term success. Okay, and, and so they, they, they looked at all the studies and they looked up what the mean time to ablation was. Uh, and clearly you can see here from this forest plot, so anything to the left side, this suggests that it favors early ablation and anything to this side favor ablation after one year of diagnosis. And clearly the patients who had an earlier ablation from the time of diagnosis, they had better long-term success. Okay, so one way to think about this is it's almost like door to balloon time for those of you who are used to seeing MIs. Because door to balloon time is that the more the earlier you treat the MI, the more muscle you save. Similarly for the atrium, I would say to you that the earlier you treat, uh, the more likely you end up getting long-term success. On the other hand, when you wait to a very, very late stage AF, what we call persistent AF, before you treat, the results are really not very good. Um, and this is studies uh, from a, a very big center in Germany when they did ablation for these patients with very chronic, very long-standing AF, success rate is only 20% after one ablation. And when you did a lot of ablations, it got up to about 55, 56%. So clearly the results from early treatment, very good, 75 to even 85%. Long-term treatment, uh, not so good for those with chronic atrial fibrillation. And that is probably not surprising because you should know that AF is a chronic disease. It is progressive. It, as, as it goes on, your atrium undergoes changes and it starts to deteriorate. So when you have early AF, we call it paroxysmal here, you have very short episodes of AF. It comes and goes, comes and goes because the heart is stimulated. Now, as time goes on, you develop persistent AF because all these AF episodes have caused your atrium to change already. And it gets to a point where the AF doesn't want to stop anymore. So all the time, whenever you're feeling the pulse, it's always an AF. And then you get to the final stage, which is called permanent AF. So no matter what you do to the heart, it's gone case already. It, it will never come back to normal rhythm. And it's a progressive disease. And the analogy can be a little bit like cancer, whereby if you treat cancer early, you get treatment results that are very, very good. You wait till metastasis and it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, most treatments don't work very well. <clears throat> and we also know that the more AF the patient has, the more uh, uh, mortality, the more strokes, the more heart failure hospitalization. So how many episodes you have and how much AF you have is important, right? So you have very little AF at the start and as you let, let the disease progress, the AF uh, becomes more and more and that translates uh, into worse outcomes for our patients. So then the, the question I then will often get is that, but I remember this study from 20 years ago, they say rate and rhythm control, no different than why, why are you telling us all this now? Because we just treat by rate control, why, why bother? Now, this, so this is the study that they are referring to, it's called Affirm and it's more than two decades old. And unfortunately, as well intended as it was when they did the study, it was actually, in hindsight, not a very well-conducted study. 
So two thirds of the patients were already in persistent permanent AF. So it's almost like taking patients with metastatic cancer and randomizing them to surgery doesn't work, right? Uh, and the doctors could stop the anticoagulation anytime. So once you see sinus rhythm, you can just stop the warfarin, okay? Even if your patients were in paroxysmal AF. And so, not surprisingly, most of the strokes in the study occurred when warfarin was stopped. So, and at the time, there was no choice. Everyone was on warfarin, so we didn't have the wax. And rhythm control wasn't very successful. So less than 65% of patients were in sinus rhythm at the end of the study. So although they intended to keep the patients out of the AF, it wasn't particularly successful. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to update everyone. So we have finally done the version of the study that we wanted to do 20 years ago. Uh, and this was published two years ago in New England. It's called the East AF Net. So 2,800 patients, many, many hospitals and many, many sites. The follow-up was very long for five years. And the idea was this, they were going to do what we call early rhythm control. So they wanted to treat patients who had had their AF diagnosis in the last one year. So we want to catch patients at the early point of their disease, not when they have had AF for a very, very long time. Uh, and they were either offered drugs or ablation, really doesn't matter, leave it up to y'all. No, no, we don't want to force you to have an ablation or you, as long as you, your intention is to keep the patient in sinus rhythm. Then the other group was what we call usual care, but which was essentially rate control. So if, the, if you have palpitations like you beta blockers, you have no palpitations, I leave you alone. But the important thing was that the warfarin or the anticoagulation was never stopped for both groups. Right? So this corrects all the mistakes that we made two decades ago. And the end point was the usual sort of uh, composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, uh, heart failure hospitalization, all the stuff that's important to our patients. Um, and I'll show you this slide just to show you what they did. So if you look at this side, which is the rhythm control side, you can see that initially only 8% of patients had ablation. Most patients were treated with medication. So propafenone, flaconide, amiodrone, dronadrone, all things that we have in Singapore. Okay, and that proportion who had ablation increased to about 19% after two years. Still very, very little. On the other hand, those who were receiving usual care, which is rate control, uh, almost no treatment. Just all were on rate control medicines. And so after, uh, at the end of the study, when you look at this, there was a 21% reduction in cardiovascular death, hospitalization, heart attacks and strokes. Uh, there was no difference in terms of the safety outcome uh, and there was a little bit more non-fatal adverse events mainly bradycardia so if you treat these patients with heart rhythm pills you expect a little bit of slow heart rate once in a while but there was no deaths from that the complication rate for those who are having AF was very very small less than one percent and you can see even if you broke it down there was a reduction in death from cardiovascular causes and there was a reduction in stroke even though everybody was taking anticoagulation. So being in sinus rhythm gave you an extra protection from getting a stroke compared to just taking anticoagulation alone. So it's not just taking anticoagulants that's important. Being in sinus rhythm was also important to prevent stroke. And so as a result of these last three studies I shared with you, this is the latest guidelines. Uh, and you will see there are some differences. First of all, the guidelines advocate that we treat atrial fibrillation early and we recommend rhythm control for these patients. And in fact, if you look at this one, I'll show you here, symptomatic paroxysmal AF, you could choose either to have antiarrhythmic drugs or if the patient chose to, they can also choose not to take drugs. Just go straight for the patient. The guidelines actually recommend that. And that is applicable for every single patient subgroup here. You can see that catheter ablation is reasonable at least or even mandated in this group uh, as a first choice therapy. And of course, if you fail drug therapy, then everybody can get the catheter ablation. But the idea is to treat the AF early and keep the patient in sinus rhythm. Okay, and so that's what we've covered over the last few slides. You can choose anterior drugs still, but clearly rhythm control is, <coughs> is important. Now, uh, and this is the last section, and we're going to talk about some of the things that we need your help with. Uh, we understand now that AF is the common endpoint for a lot of diseases. Things like thyroid disease, sleep apnea, diabetes, aging, heart failure, obesity, hypertension. 
All these things damage the atrium, and as a result of that, the final common pathway is that the patients get AF. So the question is that if there are multiple conditions that damage the health of your atrium, and then causing AF, if we treat or eradicate these conditions, are we able to prevent AF? Okay. Uh, and in the words of a young Senator Obama, the answer is yes, we can. So I, I just spent a few slides here just to explain what I'm trying to get across here. So at least 50% of our AF patients have sleep apnea. And you will find that when you, when me and Jeremy see them in clinic, very commonly we will send them for an assessment of sleep apnea. Many of them are asymptomatic sleep apnea, but severe. And so on the left hand side here, if you look at this, um, these are the results from AF ablation. And the first group are the control group, so people who don't have sleep apnea. And you see from ablation, their success rate is high, sort of 80, 70 to 80% at least. However, if they have non-severe sleep apnea, the success of ablation goes down. And if you have severe sleep apnea, the ablation is highly likely to be unsuccessful. So we have to treat the sleep apnea at the same time. Because once you look on this side, um, you can see the same thing, we look at AF recurrence, so the opposite. If you have untreated sleep apnea, which is the top line, after an ablation, 70% of patients will recur. If you have no sleep apnea, this is the recurrence rate. And if you have treated sleep apnea, you can see that it's almost the same as patients who don't have sleep apnea. So you have to treat underlying conditions, otherwise you will just encourage the AF to come back and you end up with the patients having more and more ablation. Um, and this is something that uh, unfortunately uh, those drinkers in the room don't want to see. So people always ask, does alcohol abstinence actually help my AF? And the answer is yes. And there's now a New England paper to prove it. Uh, so these are six hospitals in Australia. They had a very hard time finding Australian patients to sign up for this study. Uh, so they basically asked 700 patients and 70% of them said, no, I'm not going to give up my alcohol. So 30% who agreed. They were randomized to either abstain from alcohol for six months or the doctor said you just continue drinking and everybody was praying to be randomized to the continue drinking group. Um, and clearly if you look at this using structured follow-up, uh, the abstinence group had a higher probability of not having AF come back. <clears throat> it was still about 60%, so 40% of them still had AF recurrence. It's not like it went away completely. But nonetheless, there was an improvement compared to to patients who, who continue to drink. So, so yes, it does help. Uh, similarly, you can see the same for, for weight loss. Uh, so patients who lost weight had less AF recurrence. Uh, and this will probably tie into what Jeremy says, blood pressure lowering. So this is the SPRINT, which is the, as you know, the largest uh, randomized control trial for blood pressure. And patients who had intensive treatment, so they targeted blood pressure of less than 120, 120. Uh, the AF rates were much lower in the intensive blood pressure lowering arm compared to the standard blood pressure arm. Okay, and this is a 26% uh, reduction. So this just summarizes some things. So uh, all the bad things that our patients do, uh, if you treat them, they do get better. So if your diabetes is better controlled, you do some exercise, um, you get a 23% increase in AF if you are stressed, angry or anxious. So being happy is very protective, so be happy this year. Um, uh, obesity, of course, uh, as I showed you, and uh, AF risk is also increased in smokers, sleep apnea we talked about, and hypertension. So uh, I'm going to leave you, uh, lastly, just to remind how to hang all these things together. Everyone is very familiar with this. This is the framework we think about coronary artery disease. So you modify risk factors, so don't smoke, exercise, diet, you ask the patient, you must take your statin, must take your anti-angina, must take your aspirin. And then of course, for those patients who have very severe stenosis, you send to us and we will offer revascularization with PCI or CAPG. The framework for AF is exactly the same. So you think about risk factor modification, smoking cessation, exercise, screen for sleep apnea, treat the hypertension, diabetes. They take medication, anticoagulants, antiarrhythmics, blood pressure medicines, SGLT2s for diabetes. And then finally, for those patients who don't respond, they need invasive therapy. This revolves around catheter ablation, left atrial appendage occlusion. But the framework is exactly the same. So AF and coronary artery disease, same way to think about them. Okay. Uh, and so um, 
this is also reflected in some of the guidelines. You may read about this. This is called the ABC pathway. So A is to avoid stroke, B is to better symptom manage, and C is to treat cardiovascular and other comorbidities. I, I don't really like this. This is a little bit out of date because you realize that it's 2017 before the, the, the last few studies I shared with you earlier. So, so here, they are still a bit issue-washy about whether it should be rate or rhythm control. I think the next version of this that comes out in the next year will have a much stronger emphasis that patients should be rhythm controlled. So here's a technical message. I think we're all going to look after more and more AF patients. So please screen them opportunistically if uh, your time allows you to do that. Uh, anticoagulation is key to stroke prevention and uh, DOEX are clearly gold standard therapy. Uh, aspirin does not work and we should tell our patients that. Um, AF is a progressive and chronic disease. It doesn't go away, it doesn't get better. So patients learn to have to accept that when they have to live with the condition. Uh, please treat AF early and proactively. Rhythm control does improve survival and reduces stroke above and beyond us giving them anticoagulation. And all these treatment modalities work very synergistically. So we have to treat all components of their disease for them to have a good outcome. Uh, no different to someone who has had a bypass or multivessel PCI. Okay, with that, I thank you very much for your time.